A new wave of so-called anti-obesity drugs are promising a foolproof way of losing weight, and their popularity is growing. But just how safe are they? Welcome to Roundtable. I'm Philip Hampshire. Zempic and Wegovi were the most well-known brand names for a drug called semaglutide. It's becoming more popular as a treatment after a number of celebrities admitted it had helped them to lose serious amounts of weight. One injection a week is apparently all that it takes to suppress a person's appetite to such a level that the weight just drops off. However, the long-term effects are not well known at this point. So what are the side effects? And what happens when the injections stop? So let's meet our guests. In Derry in Northern Ireland, we have Professor Alex Miras, who's a leading obesity expert and a consultant in endocrinology at Ulster University. Meanwhile, in Bath, we have Dr. Bharat Pankanya, who's a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School. And in New York, Sarah DeSange, who's a psychotherapist who studies eating disorders. Meanwhile, in Leicestershire, we're joined by Rosemary Connolly, CBE, who is a health and fitness expert. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me. Before we get started, uh, for those viewers at home who aren't familiar with this drug, what it is, what it does, and how it's being marketed at the moment, uh, we have a small graphic here. Uh, Wegovi, which is one of the uh, brand names that this drug is sold under, is designed to suppress appetite so you eat less. It mimics the action of a gut hormone called GLP-1, which is released after eating. It slows down the movement of food in your gut so you stay full for longer. It's effective at lowering blood glu glucose, which is why it was used as a diabetes medication. And typically, it's administered via an injection once a week, although there are other alternatives. I believe that there is currently an oral gel or uh, some form of oral formula available. So, uh, Professor Miris, uh, let's start with you in uh, Northern Ireland, if we can. How on earth did a diabetes type 2 medication get transferred across to be used for weight loss? So, as you have pointed out already, uh, this medication is a synthetic form of the hormone GLP-1, which is a hormone that we all produce when we eat. And it has got uh, a number of mechanisms of action, a number of effects. The two key ones are, as you have already said, to reduce blood glucose. But what we've noticed while treating people with diabetes with this medication and other medications in the same group is that um, it also acts as an appetite suppressant because it works in the appetite centers of the brain that control our hunger and fullness. And it is for these reasons and together with the effects of the weight loss that we observed in clinical trials, that we are now beginning to use the medication for the treatment of obesity. Now, this drug has been um, uh, somewhat, as they say, as they say, as the kids would say, it's gone viral online. There are lots of TikTok marketeers saying that people should be using it for weight loss. Um, so, uh, Bharat, if I if I cross to you. In your opinion, is that a sensible use of this drug or is that not a sensible use of this drug? Is that a misuse of the drug, as it were? Well, the drug does what it does. It's an appetite suppressant, but first and foremost, it is a pretty good uh, type 2 diabetes control drug. Now, should you just allow yourself to get fat and then you use these drugs? Absolutely not. So what we have to do is... Uh, carry on with a good, healthy messaging, which is eat well, exercise well, and control your appetite, as well as, this is really, really important, set your palate from when you are a young person so that your palate is set not to be, you know, uh, desirous of high salt, high fat, um, uh, high refined carbohydrate meals. And if you set your palate right from day one, when you're a little child, you're unlikely to get fat. And that is absolutely the key. Rather than saying, I have a drug, don't worry about it. I'll get fat and then I'll take this medication and I'll get thin again. Okay, Rosemary, I saw you uh, nodding there. I see that's pretty standard advice from you, isn't it? 
I was com in complete agreement there. Um, and I wish that we could e educate our children from a very young age, and then that would make a tremendous difference. Um, my sort of philosophy is that if we were to stop people from snacking on junk food and they were able to eat three healthy meals a day and go for a 30 minute walk every day and do some strength exercises, they could transform their health and their fitness and their general weight and, and well-being. What I find so fascinating with this, and I've sort of read quite a lot about the Wigovi drug and the benefits of it, and it's not as it's not sort of a miracle weight loss drug as uh, some purport to be, but it's something that it, it sort of encourages a slow weight loss. Well, only by taking a few sensible choices, you would be able to achieve the 21 pounds in two year weight loss relatively easily. And if you were to eat foods with more fiber in it, your blood sugar levels would be much more level anyway. Um, so I'm not altogether knocking the drug because I think for certain people, I've been in my business of helping people lose weight for over 50 years. Um, and there are some people that just need something that's different. And I've, I've sort of heard of some successes in that respect. But we're not talking about the masses. We're talking about um, a, a, the few here that we really those people may benefit, but the others, we really need to change our lifestyle and take on a better, healthier lifestyle. Sarah, what about your opinion of this drug? It's generally sold as uh, semaglutide, as a generic, just in case somebody uses that alternative drug name. Yeah, my biggest concern about it is not looking into the psychological impacts of changing our appetite in this way. If my understanding is, and you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, that this has been licensed off the back of two years of weight loss data. And we don't know what happens afterwards. There are reports, we know that the weight is coming back for a lot of people. And I'm getting dozens and dozens of messages from people who have disordered eating, who've been on this weight loss medication. And afterwards, they're saying that it's left them worse off than they were before. So I feel like we need research into the psychological and biological kickback of having changed our bodies in this way on this medication and then withdrawing the medication. That's my biggest concern. Alex, I'm going to come across to you if I can. Um, as a diabetes medication, 2017, I think, is when this uh, drug was brought to the market as a diabetes medication. People with type 2 diabetes have been using it since then. The weight loss angle on it, though, is a much newer and, of course, if you like, an off-label uh, usage of the drug until relatively recently. Do we have the data to back up that it's safe to be used as a weight loss drug instead of as a diabetes medication? Yes, we do. Uh, we have got the result of randomized controlled clinical trials that clearly demonstrate that over a two-year horizon, the medication can be effective and it is safe. We also have experience from using these groups of medications for the last 16 years in the field of diabetes, and they have been shown to be uh, in the long term very safe, albeit initially they can have uh, side effects. The National Institute of Clinical Care Excellence has looked at all of the data very, very carefully, and it has approved now the medication for the use for the treatment of obesity, and it has been found it to be a cost-effective medication. So, for viewers at home who were perhaps burned by some of the diet drugs that came out in the 1980s and 90s and later turned out to cause kidney issues or liver issues, there's no indication of that with this drug, or should they be, say, skeptical of it for a little while because we only have two years' worth of clinical data? Yeah, so um, the drug is safe, but it can initially have side effects, which are gastrointestinal in nature. And usually they disappear in 95% of people who are able to stay on the medication. In the longer run, the worst case scenario in terms of physical health is that less than three in a thousand people will get pancreatitis, which is inflammation of the pancreas, or will get cholecystitis, which is inflammation of the gallbladder, but they will not get the depressive effects, the suicide issues, or the cardiovascular problems that drugs in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s were associated with. 
Uh, so if I take it across to you, Barad, as a doctor yourself, if somebody came to you and said, look, I'm having problems uh, with my weight, would you prescribe them this drug or would you look to other courses of action first? Um, giving the medication alone is not good enough. So you give the medication together with that counselling, that other support structures, and then what will happen is we will have success rates. We will have success rates which are better than just giving the medication without that conversation, without that support. But we are not going to have 100% success. Nothing is 100% successful. Rosemary. I, I think uh, one of the things that is really important to understand, and I would give credit to the drug for this, for certain people who I mentioned earlier, who really have a bad attitude to food, I'm, I'm talking about really overeating, who are sort of morbidly obese, um, and they just can't seem to get a hold of the right way of eating. For them to go on something that actually does make them not feel so hungry, helps to get them into the habit of not cooking as much food, not eating as much food, and then not being so hungry. It's something that they may not have actually felt for many, many years. And it will give them the kickstart it needs, potentially, over those two years that might just get them onto the right road. And if at the end of those two years, they've learned about exercise, because let's face it, if you're morbidly obese, going for a walk for a mile is equivalent to somebody who's reasonably slim and fit going for a 5k run. And so it's really important that we, it's used wisely and that it helps those people who really are finding it very difficult to help themselves. Using the drug wisely, of course, is a very important uh, add-on there. Um, we have here a tweet from Elon Musk who was asked, how did he lose so much weight? Because he put out a tweet saying, I've just lost 30 pounds of weight. And somebody asked him, how did you uh, lose so much weight? And he tweeted back that it was uh, a combination of fasting, uh, Ozempic, which is, uh, or Wegovi, which is another name for the drug, and no tasty food near me. Um, Sarah, as we look at this, this is the problem of human psychology. Someone like Elon Musk tweets out, hey, I'm on this drug, I've lost 30 pounds. I can see you shaking your head already. You're a little bit concerned by that, aren't you? I feel like we're oversimplifying human psychology. And when they talk about behavioral interventions, behavioral programs, behavioral support, it's not, we're not telling people things that they don't already know. People know this stuff. There might be some people that don't, but the majority of people do. When I'm working with people who are struggling with compulsive eating, believe me, a lack of nutritional knowledge, a lack of knowledge about exercise is not the problem. And we're putting out this drug. Of course, everyone's getting very excited about it. It seems like, wow, finally, we've got a drug that's going to help us with this problem. But we haven't done any research into what are people's lived experiences on this medication being on it, coming off it, what is the psychological backlash of going from having an appetite suppressant to that suddenly no longer being there? And then the, the responsibility is being put on the person, well, you should have just carried on doing these behaviours. But like our biology and our appetites are really going to be influencing those things. And I just, it's the lack of research that frustrates me. I'm not coming in here saying this is a terrible idea, it's awful, but I feel like we're rushing headlong into something um, with not enough knowledge. Alex, um, one of the issues surrounding this drug is if there's a large increase in demand, which there has been particularly over in the United States, because of these psychological effects that Sarah's been talking about, everybody uh, wants to get on with the uh, drug because it's a nice, easy route to losing weight, that's led to a shortage of the drug for people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, how do you get around that problem? Before I carry on to answer your question, I must uh, respectfully disagree with uh, my colleagues. Uh, what they are describing is the perception, the perception of obesity in the 1950s. We're now in, the, uh, in 2023, and the perception of obesity has changed completely from, from being someone's individual's fault and their responsibility to being very much a biologically driven disease, which has got very large environmental inputs. 
this is not my opinion. I'm not saying, I'm not going to uh, present to you my opinion because our opinion doesn't matter. What matters is the science and the research behind us understanding that we are now treating the disease of obesity, which is not an, in the individual's failure to control their hunger, because it is impossible to control someone's hunger, because it is determined by areas of the brain that we cannot affect by thinking. Now, that doesn't mean that we should not include um, nutritional psychological, physical activity interventions in order to address the other contributors to obesity. But at the same time, we have to address the biological drivers to obesity. And this is what the medication does. So it's not an easy way out. Has the uh, unofficial use of Ozempic and Wegovy led to um, um, uh, problems with the supply of the medication in the US? That is correct. And that has happened in other parts of the world. In fact, in the UK, I think the UK government's just said that it, uh, you're not allowed to export it from the UK, even though it's not manufactured here because they're worried about the shortages. Um, so, Alex, what would you actually be doing with regards to that issue? Um, so, um, we will have to uh, wait for the medication. Let's not confuse two medications here. They contain the, the, the same ingredient, which is a maglutide, but they have got two different names. One is Ozempic, and it's only licensed for the treatment of diabetes. Um, whereas we have got Wegovy, which contains a higher concentration of this hormone. And we expect Wegovy to become available in the next few months in the United Kingdom, and we should only start using it when it becomes available. Rosemary, did you have any comments to make on that? Um, yes, I, I think it's really interesting that this was a drug that was created for type 2 diabetics. Many type 2 diabetics are overweight, and that's part of the reason they are type 2 diabetic. Um, and the fact that it does create a weight loss for them obviously is a tremendous benefit to them in that condition. Um, but I'm concerned that those people who really need it may not have it available, as you've been discussing, if it's sort of a mad, crazy uh, demand for it for weight loss. And I think we must say, and it hasn't really been fully explained, that some of the side effects of a Wigovi are pretty grim. They really, you know, nauseous and, and diarrhea and all sleepless, not all kinds of sleep apnea, all kinds of different conditions, which honestly, I do wonder why anybody would want to take it if all they need to do is to just change, make a few changes. We're not talking about going on a diet. We're talking about making a few sensible nutritional choices and not eating the rubbish and eating the healthy stuff, more fiber, more exercise, and uh, and trying to educate us. And right as we may be may already mentioned today, from a very early age, that's when we need to get them. And let's try to prevent this problem. It's, I think it's too late for this generation, but hopefully and, but the little ones now might learn and hopefully do better than we are at our age now. Sarah, um, how much of an issue here is the failure to lose weight for people psychologically, whether they're, on, uh, whether they're following a clinical regimen or whether they're on a program of drugs? Well, I want to address what the medical community is saying about their word, obesity, is that the metabolic part of it, which I'm not denying, I'm not saying it's all trauma, it's all psychological, that's not the case at all. I know there are metabolic issues at play here. But if we're saying that we need to adjust that, then this should be a medication for life, but it's only being licensed for two years. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So therefore, we're not fixing the biological problem. If the problem's biological, we're sort of sticking a Band-Aid over it. And without the research, kind of five years later, when people are coming off this medication, we know a lot of people can diet and lose weight. And then the weight comes back. Their eating becomes out of control again. This is the bit that I'm, I'm kind of confused about how we're reconciling. But I am interested in, in my colleagues' thoughts on that. Alex? Imagine that for the treatment of the disease of hypertension, our only tool was to tell people to eat less salt. We will be having this, the problems of the disease of hypertension causing deaths 
uh, for decades after decades. Now we have got very effective medication for uh, hypertension that we do not just use uh, instead of salt reduction, we're using it together with salt reduction. And that's why the deaths from the complications of hypertension have reduced. So the National Institute for Clinical Excellence has approved the use of the medication for two years, not because um, of any other reason, but because of the lack of cost effectiveness beyond the two years. Now, um, for the same reasons that we do never stop a medication for hypertension, because if we do that, the blood pressure will increase, this medication should not be stopped for the treatment of the disease of obesity based on clinical grounds, not on cost-effectiveness grounds. So all of these medications, like nutritional therapies, like physical activity therapies, like surgical therapies, are there for life. Bharat, um, if I come across to you, um, the cost of this drug also raises other issues. Obviously, the United States is, a typical, is an outlier because uh, pharmaceuticals in the United States are typically vastly more than they are anywhere else. But over in the US, a one-month course of this drug gets a, an insurance company list price for the month of May of this year um, for three, uh, $1,361.02 per month. In the UK, it's drastically lower than that. It's about a third to half of that level. But still, if you're putting out 400 pounds, 350 pounds a month, and there's an awfully large number of people who want to take the drug because they're either obese or they're clinically obese, or they want to lose weight, or they're diabetic because we have these multiple uses for the drug, that is an expen extremely expensive call on the NHS, which is a national health service, I see you shaking your head. How do you square those circles? Yeah, <laughs> I'll tell you why I was shaking my head, because I agree with Professor Alex. Let me explain, All right? So if you are obese or your diabetes is poorly controlled, or for that matter, your blood pressure is poorly controlled because I denied you uh, beta blockers or anti-obesogenic drugs, yeah? What happens? is you end up in hospital. And you end up in hospital with your heart attack, your stroke, your arthritis, and several other illnesses, which are extremely expensive to treat. So on the basis of, if you said 400 pounds, well, you need to look at it like this. My expenditure of 400 pounds per month on this person actually stops them presenting me with a bill worth thousands of pounds later on, and that does happen. So if you look at it with the eye that this is a preventative measure, then there are health economists, and I'm not one of them, who will be able to work it out very precisely for you that on the basis of other pathologies saved, this is good value for money. Sarah, if I could uh, just come across to you, how does it work for younger people when they're seeing celebrities on TikTok, on Twitter, saying that they are taking this drug? Uh, what is the impact of that on them? Well, that's the problem, isn't it, is that this is going to be used as a diet aid. And we know that dieting is one of the biggest predictors of developing eating disorders and disordered eating. So I think that's one of the problems. With the wider availability of this drug, people will be able to get hold of it even if it's not technically available for that use. The more of it that's in the country, the more it will get out there. Um, so there's always that risk that we are setting people up, young people up, for even an even higher rate of eating disorders, which is already on the rise. So I think there is that aspect to this medication where we may be looking at a social issue further down the line in that aspect with people's mental health because of the weight stigma as well, right? Alex, very quickly, last question to you. Often when a new drug comes into the marketplace, there are other follow-on drugs that come along very quickly behind it. Uh, I'm thinking of Viagra was followed very quickly by Cialis, followed by Levitra very quickly after that. Is there anything else on the marketplace in the pipeline to follow up after this drug? The revolution in obesity pharmacotherapy is taking place as we speak. This is a fantastic time to be in this field. Um, uh, Wegovic causes an average weight loss of 16%. 
And with the medications that we're going to have by 2025, we will be able to cause an average weight loss of 22 to 27% weight loss. And as Barrett has said, uh, it is always an equation between cost and effectiveness. And if we're able to uh, reduce the suffering of these people, uh, for these people, and if we're able to reduce the complications, the costly complications of obesity in our healthcare system and society, I think in addition to a multidisciplinary approach for the treatment of the disease of obesity, this is certainly money well spent. Alex, Barat, Sarah, Rosemary, it's been an absolute pleasure having all four of you on the show today. Thank you very much for joining me and agreeing to talk about this subject. But remember, you can see more discussion and debate if you head on over to our YouTube channel. Just head on over to YouTube and search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and all of the team, thank you for watching and goodbye. <laughs>